<laughs> yeah. Very good. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Incubator Podcast at the CHNC Symposium in Denver, Colorado. We are joined by Dr. Aaron Hamvas from uh, the Lurie Children's Hospital. You're the division chief there. And uh, we were just reminiscing of our uh, interaction at the recent District 6 uh, meeting in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Hamvas, thank you. Thank you for being on. Well, thank you. Thank you. This was a great opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you presented yesterday on uh, the topic of BPD, which has a lot of uh, time dedicated to it. Can you tell us a little bit about what you focused on and, and what are some of the things you wanted to leave the audience with uh, with your talk? Yeah, sure. So for so long, I mean, BPD has been one of those mm-hmm. yeah. issues that has been confounding to neonatologists forever. And, you know, we've always had the question, you have a two babies who look exactly alike in, in terms of clinical and demographics, right. etc. But yet they have such disparate outcomes. And so the question comes, is there a potentially a genetic contribution to those uh, outcomes? Not necessarily is, is it a genetic disease per mm-hmm. se, but is there... Predisposition. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, we're not, they're not all starting on the same foot. It's not because they're, these three babies are born at 26 weeks that they're automatically equal patients. They may have other factors that could be contributing to their clinical course. Absolutely. So there's the prenatal environment, yeah. there's the perinatal environment, etc. So, so, but the The question of genetics or genetic contributions has been one that's been around for multiple Mm -hmm. years. And with the new genomic technologies, it's becoming more a more accessible question to try to answer. Um, So uh, in the talk yesterday, I just kind of reviewed some of the circumstantial data that we have about whether BPD is um, has a genetic or a heritable component. And there's a lot of animal work that suggests it. there's some human studies, but none of these studies have, have validated each other. And I think one of the major problems with the the ability for these studies to not replicate each other is the definition of BPD mm-hmm. to begin with. And we go round and round. So you, so you solved that in the introduction. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. So so um, I think you know several people, and this is really something that I really started to bring up yesterday is. Um, if we think about subphenotypes of BPD, mm. does that get us closer to mechanism? Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, we know about the vascular phenotype, we know large airways, parenchymal disease, etc. cetera. Um, but at what point is it sufficient to really understand BPD? Is it 36 weeks? Is it a mm. year? Is it Interesting. Yeah. longer term? Yeah. And so... Um, uh, so I think these are these are just major questions, and, and part of the of, with the existing genomic technology, it's hard to get enough sample size mm-hmm. to, right. to get a. So we really need to think about different approaches to this, and so I spent a few minutes talking about a, um, a NIH grant that I was fortunate to to just receive, where we're looking at the longer term cardiorespiratory outcomes right. of premi- babies born prematurely who have it, some existing genetic data or DNA to which we can do wow. very large scale on genetics, really looking at pathways, using novel uh, statistical techniques to and AI to kind of define phenotypes based on a lot of clinical and genetic data, and then also to use what I call reverse genomics to mm. use use genetic pathways to define a phenotype and so that study is just getting underway but um, but I think that you know among the question for the whole um, BPD symposium yesterday was you know how do we move from where we are and there were a lot of really interesting talks in terms of you know how can we improve feeding practices a big question that I think really uh, is ripe for um, research and, and really clinical improvement is the transition of former premature babies into the adult mm-hmm. care world. Right. For sure. Um, because the people were mentioning it, how many of your internists have asked you, what was your gestational That's age right. or your birth mm-hmm. weight at birth? And so, so really thinking about that continuum, uh, I think is going to be an important point. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because, you know, we think, oh gosh, a few months, we have so much data, so much information in a few months, but that's just a small, tiny part of this baby's entire life and clinical picture. Um, so I think us neonatologists kind of 
seeing what you're seeing in the big picture, the bird's eye view, and kind of working our way backwards into what does that translate uh, for babies in the future. And the NICU is really exciting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, and talking about the adult population, we're still struggling to just transition babies to pediatric care, right? So I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think we don't know what the implications of prematurity are when you're mm -hmm. 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is still some, this is still an emerging subject for us as a as a field and and especially considering that while our field is still very young, the babies that are currently surviving are not the babies that survived 20, 30 right. years ago. So even the data that we currently have target. on adult preemies is not the same that we will need to look at in 20 years from now. So I mm -hmm. think that's that's very interesting. Um any thoughts on, on, I mean, I think what something you mentioned, which I think is a very interesting, is that when it comes to genomics and, and w it tends to always be very overwhelming answers. And so I think when you mentioned that incorporating artificial intelligence to sort of help see patterns through these results is something that's very interesting. Um, is there specific plans on how you're hoping to do that? Um, so I'm no expert by any means on this. So we have some very uh, astute collaborators who know how to do that in, in more detail. Yeah. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Well, um, we wish you the best of luck. This is very interesting. And, and is, there, um, is there yet a, a name for this, uh, for this study or for this trial? Yeah, we, we call it the Leopard Project. Mm. Okay. All right. Long-term endotypes of prematurity-associated respiratory disease. Ooh. I love that. That's a good I one. That's that. a good one. Okay. That's a good one. We're always in the running. It, go, for it goes on the board. That's right. It goes on our board of uh, favorite study names. So we'll look out for the, for the, the, <laughs> the results of the Leopard Trial. Thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Hamas. This was great. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for the service that you provide to the community. Of course. Sure. Of course. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thanks.